You know, when I was asked to give this talk, I was really excited because this is something that I'm passionate about, and this is one of the big reasons why um, I wanted to come to Yale. And um, hopefully, you know, I can spread my love for a whole up a little bit today, and maybe even convince some of the audience members to get a whole up. <laughs> So um, I have no ties to industry, but like Dr. Amir Khan admitted, um, I do own a Hola Peelers t-shirt. Um, it's very comfortable, highly recommended. And of course I love Hola. So some of the, the literature that I'll be showing today will be a little bit Hola centric. So um, today I'll be talking to you first about why Hola. Um, I know Dr. Amir Khan gave a beautiful review of the current literature on Hola. Um, and the randomized clinical trial. So I'll do a very quick review um, and hopefully I'll, I'll be able to tell you some unique advantages that you didn't really know about. Um, then I'll be going into why isn't whole life used more often? Um, and this isn't just a learning curve because a lot of times when people think about whole life, the one thing that they know about it is that it's hard to learn. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the, the factors are actually um, money related. So uh, then I'll go into the current state of whole at Yale and the, um, the vision that we have for Yale as a center of excellence for BPH. So of course, first, what is HOLEP? HOLEP stands for homium laser nucleation of the prostate. And it really can be simple, one word, which is enucleation. And essentially, HOLEP is the endoscopic version of a simple prostatectomy, which can be done uh, by using either the, the surgeon's finger in an open simple prostatectomy or a robotic instrument in a robotic simple prostatectomy to um, enucleate or uh, peel off the adenoma or the entire transition zone from the, the surgical capsule. Um, this is not only done using homium, but also can be done using pretty much ener any energy source. Um, the energy source is mainly to uh, make the dissection uh, without getting into too much bleeding. And so enucleation procedures, um, what's special about them and in, in the reason why they can remove so much tissue, one of the reasons is because the um, surgical endpoint is much more objective, meaning that you are dissecting along an anatomic plane and there's no judgment call that you really have to make as to whether you've removed enough tissue or not. Um, this is as opposed to most BPH procedures that are available today um, that are classically known as channel procedures. And the reason why they're called channel procedures is because you basically make the channel wider from the inside. And so um, there is a judgment call that you have to make during these procedures. And there's more of a um, judgment call made by the surgeon as to whether you've removed enough adenoma and if the channel is wide enough. So really quickly, um, I know Dr. Singh is giving a uh, comprehensive lecture on laser soon, but why do we use homium as the most common tool to perform the surgery? Well, we take advantage of the low depth of penetration. Um, it has a depth of penetration of 0.4 millimeters. So you can dissect the plane, get a good view without having to worry about um, burning holes in the tissue. And it's a pulse laser, and this gives way to a, a much uh, more clear dissection. There's less charring, so you can delineate the anatomic plane without issues. And it's also been shown um, over and over again to be very good at achieving hemostasis. It's also versatile. It's, it's basically ubiquitous in modern endourology. It's available in any endourology suite because it's, it's used to uh, treat stones as well, which is the bread and butter of urology. Um, and it can also be used to ablate tissue. So in the, um, not too long ago, there were actually um, surgeons that were ablating the you know, lateral lobes using homium tissue instead of just peeling them out. Um, and so uh, you can also perform same stage stone treatment to treat bladder stones and kidney stones as we'll talk about more. So why am I such a firm believer in HOLEP? Well, in large prostates, um, you know, the closest competitor is really robotic simple prostatectomy. And Dr. Amir Khan did a wonderful job um, going into a lot of the data in the randomized clinical trials, uh, controlled trials, comparing HOLEP versus RASP. And he highlighted uh, differences like shorter hospital stay, shorter catheter time, less bleeding, and shorter operation time. 
uh, for very experienced whole up surgeons um, as advantages of whole up over robotic simple prostatectomy. But still, I think the, the one advantage that comes to mind first when we think about um, whole up compared to robotic simple prostatectomy is the lack of incisions. And I think this is the reason why a lot of times people still think about whole up as merely an alternative to the simple prostatectomy. But we have to forget that um, the benefits of whole up extend to small and medium prostates. In fact, the randomized clinical trials um, showing the benefits of whole up, a lot of them are comparing whole up to TERP and PVP in prostates less than 80 uh, cubic centimeters. And so in addition to, in, in these small and medium prostates, in addition to, to <clears throat> excuse me, the um, known advantages of shorter hospital stay, shorter catheterization time and less bleeding, you're also just removing more tissue. So in a lot of these studies, if you um, that follow patients for over five years, um, they show that um, it's definitely more durable than things like TERP and PVP. So um, as it's been hammered into your brains, HOLEP is thus the only modality that's size independent by the AUA guidelines. And in fact, it's actually by the 2021 AUA guidelines, it's the only modality to be recommended with the same grade B level of evidence as the gold standard, which is the TERP. And that's a size independent, again, recommendation. Other size independent advantages, well, it has excellent outcomes in men that are presenting with urinary retention. Um, these are three papers, one of which was by Dr. Lingeman, who uh, pioneered this technique in the US. These three studies quoted a catheter free rate of 98 to 100% in men with urinary retention before surgery. Even in men with UDS confirmed impaired detrusor cont contractility, Dr. Cranbeck's group proved in this prospective trial that most of these men end up being able to avoid without a catheter. Um, even though 20% of them needed to use Calcelva, it just is a testament to the fact that we're removing more tissue and the less bladder outlet resistance that we have, the greater the chance of them passing a board trial. And interestingly, 79% of these patients had video urodynamic study proven return of the trucer function with a median follow-up of 25 months. So another advantage that we uh, often don't think about is what happens to the PSA after BPH surgery? So with channel procedures where you're leaving behind um, at least some tissue, you don't get quite as predictable of a PSA drop as you do in whole up. So if your PSA doesn't fall below a level of about 1.1 or 1.2 after whole up, you have to start thinking about this as, uh, you know, you have to have some suspicion that um, there could be prostate cancer in the peripheral zone, and it would be very reasonable to further work up for prostate cancer using, let's say, an MRI if they don't already have one. And lastly, whole up can be seen as sort of the cleanup crew of BPH procedures. The outcomes for whole up in the retreatment setting have been shown to be great. Uh, this is a paper from Dr. Miller's group from Vanderbilt, but we also have some data from Yale showing uh, in our abstract presented at the New England AUA that the retreatment, in the retreatment setting, it's also great surgery. And the outcomes are similar in redo whole up versus primary whole up. And this really speaks to the fact that even with um, after past channel procedures, you have distorted channel anatomy. And even when you have distorted channel anatomy, you still have that anatomic plane be preserved and untouched. And so it's, it's very feasible to do in this setting. So those are the advantages that are, have been proven in clinical trials. These are uh, a couple of a few cases of mine that um, I would like to use to sort of highlight these advantages that can't quite be captured in a clinical trial. Uh, so this first case is a 68 year old gentleman with severely bothersome lutz with an IPSS of 33. His PVR was elevated at 200 cc's and on office transrectal ultrasound measurement, his prostate volume was measured at about 160 cc's. So what are the options that we have to offer this man? Well, of course, he can get a open or robotic simple prostatectomy. Um, I also counseled him on whole up, of course, and uh, that's what he ultimately went with. And uh, during the procedure, we were surprised to find three bladder stones that were 
uh, not too big, but we were able to treat them using the Moses laser, the same laser fiber that we use to treat the prostate. And it only took us 10 minutes to treat these stones. And after that, uh, we enucleated the prostate and got about 142 grams of tissue. And so more importantly, the next day, the patient passed his void trial, his catheter was, was removed, his urine was clear, and he had immediate continence, uh, which doesn't always happen, but it was a great result in this case. Um, and so the total case time was about 178 minutes, which if you think about it, um, you know, treating a prostate this large with other, other modalities would be the same time or even longer. And um, I know at least one person in this room that could have done this case faster. Uh, keep in mind that this was my fourth whole lip ever. So uh, getting faster and faster. This is uh, patient number two. He has a medium sized prostate, uh, medium to medium large. Um, he is a 78 year old man who presented to me in urinary retention requiring a chronic indwelling catheter. On CT imaging, he was found to have uh, what looked like a goose egg. It was about a four centimeter bladder stone and his prostate measured about 80 cc's on CT. So of course he was counseled on the same options of whole up versus open simple prostatectomy versus robotic simple prostatectomy. And um, so this was a really hard stone. So stone treatment took about 90 minutes, but I'm about to show you a video of what the stone looked like and it was incredibly hard. Uh, we were able to still treat it though using the same equipment that we would have used for a whole up using a Trilogy wand which is a ultrasonic lithotriptor. So case went well. Let me just show you really quickly, play this video to show you how hard the stone is. And it's obviously, uh, we didn't go this fast. It's this video is sped up, uh, I think two X. But then after treating the stone with a trilogy one, we were able to nucleate it. And it's really nice to still have the laser on board to treat those residual fragments if you find them hiding behind the median lobe. Uh, but the point is, we used the uh, morsoscope, which is essentially the offset nephroscope, to be able to introduce this trilogy one, which otherwise wouldn't have fit in a normal resectoscope or cystoscope. Um, and this really sped up the, the stone treatment because of, without this, you know, you'd have to do very likely an open incision to remove the bladder stone. So this is uh, patient number three. He has a smaller prostate but this is an 84 year old man who presented with, um, he was also in chronic retention, had seen me in the office a couple of weeks before being admitted with severe hematuria. And by CT, he had about a 40 cc prostate. He was also a man that had a extensive cardiac history and had a drug eluting stent placed less than a year ago. And um, he was maintained on Zarelto at the time. So uh, case went very well. Um, he was void trial post up day one and he left the hospital with clear yellow urine. So this is one of the more gratifying cases that I've done. Um, of course, the um, benefits were that we were still able to per, uh, perform the whole up with Zarelto on board. Um, we were able to more slate the clot in about, it was actually less than 10 minutes. We were just kind of troubleshooting with the more slater, but it's a very quick enucleation and um, his outcome was very good. So this is an example of why um, the AUA guidelines actually highlight that for patients that are more medically complicated, uh, such as those on anticoagulation, are better fit for procedures like HOLEP. And HOLEP is one of the three procedures that were included. But uh, the another procedure out of the three is THULEP, which is essentially the same concept, just done with a different laser. So this patient, this last case is a special circumstance. So he is a patient that was referred to me for an obstructing renal pelvis stone and had presented for an elective ureteroscopy. And he had an IPSS of 34. He had a 190 cc prostate and a massive intravesical median lobe, as you can see on this CAT scan. Um, after we finished treating his kidney stone, we noticed some profuse bleeding from the median lobe. We had actually planned on placing the catheter and, and keeping it in until outpatient follow-up. But on placement of the catheter, it was just too much bleeding. And 
Um, I had actually talked to him about, about a whole app and he wanted it, but just wanted to defer three weeks just so they can go back to work the next day, the next week. Um, so, you know, from the way that Azurian was looking, it was very clear that he wasn't going to go back to work the next week. He was going to sit in the hospital for days. He would have potentially been, uh, we would have potentially had to bring him back to the operating room for further cauterization. So we made the decision not to wake him up. We removed the catheter. We went back in with the scope and we were sort of chasing our tails with the rollerball for a while until we realized, you know, there's nothing really that's going to stop this bleeding aside from time. And so we uh, managed to call the daughter and the entire family was there actually. So we, we talked to them about the decision to perform a whole up. Um, we, we explained the bleeding complication that we had run into and they had agreed to uh, proceed with whole up. So this, in this case, we, uh, we removed about 170 grams of tissue, and he was able to leave on post update two after passing the board trial. And um, he was very happy that you know we we made this one stop uh, one stop shop for him. So you you may think with all these benefits that whole up is some new sexy technique. It actually has been around for over 20 years, and this is the pivotal trial by the um, man who invented it, Dr. Gilling. Uh, from New Zealand, and uh, this pivotal trial is a year after it came out, and um, it was a study of 120 patients. Again, these were medium-sized prostates, and HOLEP was found to have uh, equivalent functional outcomes as TERP, and HOLEP was, was also favored for catheter time, hospital stay, and complications. TERP was actually favored for operative time, but keep in mind that this was less than a year after the procedure came out. Um, about a year later, Dr. Lingaman from uh, Indiana University paid a visit to Australia, um, sorry, not Australia, New Zealand, and uh, observed a whole up and brought it back to the U.S. And it was his observation that they were just removing a lot more tissue uh, during the whole up compared to his terps. And so if the procedure is so old and, um, you know, we've obviously shown its benefits, um, why is it not performed more often in the States? This is a paper that looked at Nesquip data from 2011 to 2015 from 600 hospitals. And it showed that HOLEP is still comprised of only 5% of all BPH procedures. Interestingly, um, HOLEP was less performed than TERPs done for adenoma regrowth. This is another paper looking at more recent data based on ABU case logs. Uh, this paper is out of a group from Cornell that looked at the current practice patterns in surgical management of BPH. Uh, you can see here that the whole up, um, the use of whole up was the same as the previous paper, around five or six percent. And if you look at the little peach colored sliver in these bars, um, that's the utilization rate of whole up. Um, interestingly, the Euro, since the Eurolift CPT came, code came out in the early 2010s, you can see that the use of Eurolift has increased exponentially. And actually, um, out of these cases today, Eurolift comprises about 33% of all BPH cases. Um, and so another thing that this paper found was that there's significant geographic variation in whole up utilization. It was less likely to be formed, interestingly, in the Mid-Atlantic and New England regions. So there's clearly uh, less tapped markets, even within the um, sparsity of whole up centers. So one of the reasons I think why whole up is a little less uh, commonly performed is that there's so many options these days that Oftentimes, we as urologists can feel overwhelmed with a number of options, and a lot of these options are, are more easily adopted by surgeons and their institutions. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the, some of the barriers that we encounter to, um, as a surgeon, as an institution, to adopting whole up in our practice? So I'll talk a little bit about how uh, the industry back marketing of, of some of these other procedures on this list uh, really help them become popularized and the lack thereof in whole up, um, you know, where it's sort of against it. I'll talk a little bit about the equipment cost up front and the quick uh, mention of robotic technology. It's very popular in the States. And of course, uh, residents these days, it's very 
pop, it's very common for residents to graduate from their training programs with zero uh, experience in whole lab. Um, in the meantime, they're taught instead of removing something through a natural orifice to make six or seven incisions to remove it with the robot um, or uh, through the classic way, which is open simple prostatectomy. And of course, I'll also talk briefly about the learning curve. So again, industry-backed um, procedures for treating BPH. Resume is backed by Boston Scientific. You got Eurolift, that's backed by Teleflex. And Operation, that's backed by Procept. And even the green light laser, that's backed by Boston Scientific. Um, but there's nothing really backing whole up. Um, and that might change a little bit after Boston Scientific acquired Luminous um, just a couple of years ago. And they are promoting things like Moses 2.0 and in treating, in performing whole ups. And um, that's sort of getting a whole up more visible in the market. Um, quickly about the specialized equipment. Um, you don't need a high powered laser to do a whole up. In fact, it's been shown that you can even use a low powered laser to perform this, but ideally you'd want a high powered laser. Um, that's not the greatest issue typically because they are also used to treat stones. Some other pieces of equipment that might be um, challenging to initially acquire is the Morse leader scope. It's, it is just essentially a nephroscope, but in order to include it in separate hole up trays, you need to get more of these for your institution. And that can cost about $30,000. And the Morse leader handpiece and the Morse leader system, which is obviously necessary to do the hole up, it costs another $20,000. So if you're still in your learning curve, how are you gonna justify spending so much money on the upfront cost of the equipment, of the very specialized equipment that you need to perform whole up. So I'll talk now about the steep learning curve. And this is, it hits home to me because of course I'm still sort of on that learning curve. And, um, and when you think about why whole up is so difficult to learn, um, I can attest to that because I spent a very intense four to six week period with Dr. Kellner learning this procedure and it was very difficult and um, I was thankful to have a very good mentor. Um, the reason why this whole up is, is so hard to learn is that it's not intuitive. You're, what you see on the screen is basically your, your face is shoved against the line of dissection and the only way that you can get a big picture is to just keep one in your head. And so... Um, it's not intuitive. You have to think in 3D dimensions. It's very difficult, unlike channel procedures, to stop in the middle and just come back to it. Um, of course, if you haven't removed enough tissue in a channel procedure, you can just place a catheter, um, maybe even stage it. But as long as they can void, you know, you've done a good surgery. Um, and especially early in your learning curve, it's very difficult to build that initial volume. And the volume is important because if you have if you're not doing that many hole ups, then it's very difficult to improve your skills. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll see in a little bit that your outcomes won't improve as quite as fast as you want them to. And um, another deterring factor for new hole up surgeons is the fear of poor early outcomes. And especially when you're counseling patients, one of the things um, you know, that you sort of tiptoe around <laughs> is the risk of long-term stress incontinence. And that's the biggest fear out of new hole-up surgeons. Um, I included a couple studies here because there are a lot of studies that look at the learning curve of hole-up. Um, and, and all of them show that the more experience that you have with hole-up, the more uh, that you go through the learning curve, the better your outcomes are. And this is a paper from Japan um, looking at 39 surgeons with different, experience, different levels of experience with hole-up. Mm -hmm. And they found that, of course, the more experience you have with whole up, the um, more significantly you improve your surgical time, enucleation time, and urinary incontinence. And this group found a sharp drop off in the rate of long term urinary incontinence at uh, past about 20 cases. This is another study that came out of Boston from Lori Lerner's group. Um, they looked at uh, stress incontinence during the learning curve of HOLUP, and they found that the longer length of time between cases was associated with a greater increase, a greater rate of stress incontinence, urinary incontinence. Uh, they found that if you have about five weeks between each of your cases, you have about a 4.7 uh, time, times increased rate of stress urinary incontinence at three months. 
And so in addition to stress incontinence, there's so many other complications and holdups that um, you can fear and as a, as a new holdup surgeon and can deter you from this procedure. And I'm very close to this because I also, you know, very recently had a big scare and I had a patient come back with a fever to 106.9. And when you, when you think about all the possible things that could happen, I mean, a million thoughts just raced through my head. And I was thinking of all these crazy complications that could result from the surgery, like uh, for example, a rectal injury being the most concerning. Uh, but the CAT scan was actually unremarkable. It was, um, the patient actually ended up having a really bad polonephritis. And while that's still a serious complication, it's not, um, you know, thankfully not something that I could have prevented by technically doing something different. Although, um, could you say that this was because I was sort of early on in my learning curve? Um, well, the case things that I was thinking about with this case was that the morsoscope actually malfunctioned and the inflow was occluded basically the whole time. And, and so we were spending a lot more time achieving hemostasis. And this case, that could have been much faster, actually lasted about three hours. Um, could you argue that he wouldn't have as, he, he wouldn't have had as bad of a, an infection if the case was shorter? Um, you could. So um, mentorship, of course, um, me as a testament to that makes a huge impact on your learning curve. And the problem with mentorship and hold up is that since it's such a unique skill, and of course you saw that it's very, um, very much less commonly used than things like TERP, there are much, much fewer mentors available and less exposure during general training. There was a, uh, this was the biggest meta-analysis assessing the whole up learning curve, looking at about 22 studies. And they, they identified the learning curve for whole up to be about 20 to 60 cases. Um, two studies identified it as less than 20 cases, but these studies all pretty much agreed that if you have a mentor, it, you can actually get through the learning curve in about half the number of cases. And the authors recommend that if you are unsur unsupervised, you should have about 50 cases under your belt before you feel more comfortable with the case. Um, and under the mentorship model, that is reduced to about 25 cases. And the lack of mentorship across the board in these studies led to a higher <laughs> conversion to TERP in the first 20 to 30 cases. So I'm not the first one to graduate from Mass General and do whole ups. Um, these colleagues were actually all senior residents of mine and, and they happened to go on to learn whole up. Um, each one of these had, these people had a different uh, route to getting, to performing whole ups. Um, Dr. Vanderbilt under Dr. Miller, uh, Michelle Kim was, and Michael Grant were taught by Dr. Tabitha Bai at the time during her residency. And um, Dr. Yamani was purely self-taught and he now practices in New York City and Lenox Hill Hospital. Um, so far, I think he's the only one in New York City that is doing hole-ups now. And uh, luckily for me, I was able to come here and learn hole-ups with Dr. Kelder. Um, he had already built a very robust volume of hole-ups and we spent about six intensive weeks um, getting me trained up. And uh, in addition, reviewing videos and uh, not only my own videos recorded from surgery, um, but also uh, figures on YouTube that post a lot of videos really helped me learn this. And so I, I went through this um, sort of pro progressive sequential learning um, mm -hmm. through these following steps that really helped me um, learn whole up and, and, you know, hit the, hit the ground running when I left the nest. But I think using these steps, we can really work on training our trainees better in whole up. And um, Dr. Kellner and I uh, will eventually think of a more standardized training plan for these trainees. So the learning curve didn't really stop the Europeans. They have about 20 courses that teach us how to do whole ups. And, um, you know, whole up is a lot more popular in Europe. So there must be something else in the States um, that's preventing pull up from being adopted as well. And if you think about it, one of these reasons is the low reimbursement. And so, um, you know, reimbursement for whole up for the amount of time that it takes and for the amount of expertise that it takes is incredibly low. And if you think about it, um, you can, you can accomplish something like an aqua ablation. You can do like eight aqua ablations in one day, and that's a lot more money that you're 
you know, being reimbursed for. Um, and so these days we're, we're really being incentivized, uh, not for our 20 year outcomes, but really for how much we can do of something we can do and in what setting we can do it in. But if you think about it from a, from a systems perspective, like this paper showed, HOLAP is the most cost-effective method. Um, in smaller prostates compared to bipolar, terap, resume, and Eurolift, it's more cost-effective. And for larger prostates, it's more effective than simple, uh, open simple or robotic simple prostatectomy. So the current state of HOLAP at Yale, um, I already mentioned Dr. Keller's excellent volume, but he actually wrote up a paper on his learning curve and, and he's had a tremendous improvement in basically all parameters of his operation. Um, things like average pathology volume, overall operation time, his, his nucleating efficiency, laser efficiency, and his incontinence rates. And uh, his current total is over 900 whole ups. Um, I don't wanna go too much into his data because I don't wanna steal his spotlight. Um, but he's been having excellent results with the surgery at Yale. And um, this is a interesting, this is a plug for our, one of our residents, Dr. Ankur Choksi, who wrote this great abstract on how a general urologist practice changes after introducing HOLAP. And so this is just to show you the sheer number of HOLAPs that were, that were brought to Yale after introducing this surgery. And this isn't just taking from surgeries like TERP or TUIP. These were brand new patients that were brought in, um, mostly from our own backyard, actually. And so we've built this incredible volume of BPH and whole ups uh, within our own backyard. And our next goal is to spread this regionally and hopefully attract more patients from all of New England. So we're now on, on the launching pad. We have a huge regional volume. We have an experienced surgeon and I'm getting there. Um, we have a very skilled, experienced support staff that is able to take care of these patients and uh, we have a very solid team. We have the necessary equipment to perform the surgery and there's definitely the demand in, in the procedure. We also have a REDCap database and uh, we are working on several retrospective studies and eventually prospective studies studying the outcomes of HOLEP and we plan to be a research powerhouse. And um, Hurricane Lee is coming. <laughs> so um, you know, this is our, our ultimate goal, um, to create this destination EPH center at Yale. And I think we're on a very good track to do so. Um, you know, Thankfully, I can't thank Dr. Keller enough for teaching me how to do a whole up. And I'm really excited to, to build this, uh, this center of excellence here at Yale. So take home points, HOLIP offers um, proven advantages over other treatments independent of prostate size. There are several barriers that limit the widespread adoption of HOLIP in the US, including economic reasons and of course the learning curve. And temporary incontinence is the biggest hurdle in terms of outcomes um, after HOLIP, but these, this improves with experience. And Currently, Yale is a very high volume BPH center locally and is on the verge of becoming a regional destination center for treatment of BPH. These are my acknowledgements. Questions, please. <laughs>